G'day, you're listening to the Big Breakdown Podcast with Chris Stafford and Harrison Marshall. Take it away, fellas. Hello and welcome along to episode four of the Big Breakdown Podcast. I hope you're well and staying safe with, uh, with everything that's going on in the world at the moment. Uh, Harrison... Episode four. It's gone quite quickly. Yes, yes, yeah, very quickly. Um, enjoyable, enjoyable. Um, yeah, we're flying, we're flying through, absolutely flying through. Yeah, just uh, just a reminder, you can uh, engage with the conversation on uh, Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> and Facebook. Uh, Big breakdown HQ. Um, don't forget to uh, comment on the videos. Let us know what you're uh, thinking. Try and be kind. Um, you know, we're, we're quite we're, we're in the process of shaping what what season two is going to be like. So, you know, we'll quite happily take some some ideas and tips for from, from people that might want some questions answering. Um, just um, just on the reflections, then, Harrison, what, what's what, what have you thought of the last last few episodes with um, with Sharpie and, and Dicko? Oh, very interesting. Um, you know, I think we've we've both learned learned things that we that we might not we might not have known before that so I think for us it's quite it's it's great that we're spreading this out to everyone but for me on an individual level I'm not learning some things which you know at my young old age we can we can never get we can never get too much of so you know I think with the one with Sharpie I think it opened my eyes to just how much you know the, imp- the importance of those fundamental movement skills and in creating an enjoyable environment for for, the, for those younger for those younger age groups and actually how you know it doesn't have to be you know, a chore to to get them, you know, working working to, you know, work, working hard at these fundamental movements. And then with with Dicko, it gave us a nice insight into the ins and outs of of how to successfully or potentially, hopefully, successfully run run an academy setup. Um, what I mean, yeah, your no, kind of being big takeaways. Uh, yeah, but yeah, no, I know I, I agree with everything you, you've 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 sort of just touched on. I think for me, it was more. We wanted them first few episodes to be really focused on understanding the who and you know the, the participants that we've got and, and how we can make the most engaging sessions, but also then develop them on. Um, and, I, and I think both Sharpie and Dicko have given some real good examples how coaches can use some of this stuff in in the practice. I mean, we were we were chatting to, to Stuart after the call briefly, and, and he touched on that. You know, of the of the whole of this, <clears throat> one thing COVID has has done is it's, it's caused people to 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 take more interest in terms of their learning, and they've, they've gone off and listened to more podcasts or read some books. But the, the the risk is then eventually just throwing that all out in in session one, isn't it? And and really just neglecting what the wants and needs of the participants are. And actually, the first the first episode, the first thing we could probably do in that first session back is go back to the, the players and say, well, what do you want? Exactly, and I think, you know, and also I think we've got a great opportunity now, and I know that it's, you know, we're all in different places across across the country and potentially the world. Um, you know, we're separated from our country, we're, we're separated from our from our players. You know, so actually understanding the who is 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 a it's a great chance to be doing this. It's a great chance to you know to get to know the players really really on a personal basis to you know to, to build those foundations. So so when you do come back and you want to you know begin those coaching. Um, you know, we've got those foundations in place to actually understand what the what the players want, what the, you know, what do they want from this session? Um, you know, so we can practice it now. We can practice, you know, practice what we preach. You know, I think we're, you know, in our lines of work, working with the players that we that we've got right now and building up those relationships and understanding. So, I'm definitely, you know, out of the first three episodes, I've, I've very much taken on board what, what I've learned from Sharpie and Dicko. Yeah, like I say, it's stuff that, that you can do now. None of this stuff needs to be waited until we can actually get back out onto the training pitch. We can we can start doing this now. I think sort of one one thing to sort of add on the the whole point of this is is one to, to get coaches on, share ideas about how we can transition that professional environment down to the grassroots game and give coaches tips and ideas of what they can do. But then there's also the the YouTube channel is is going to be a big part of that with with videos. Um, so, for example, uh, me and Sharpie um, in December, uh, before before the lockdown met up, and actually did some some videos around some of the fundamental movement exercises that we got. The one issue we have is because it was quite early in recording, and I didn't necessarily have the right 
gear if the wind was horrific. So we've actually not had that video to go out because the quality of it, in terms of the, you can't really hear anything that we're saying. But uh, I, I spoke to Sharpie the other day and what we're going to try and do, because there's been quite a little bit of feedback asking for the idea of the movements that he spoke about, um, we're going to try and clip a video together of what the movements are with, with me and Sharpie sort of speaking over it at the same time. So that is something that we'll hopefully um, hopefully be able to go out just after this is as aired, really. Um, it's cool. just... Sharpie can sort out that running technique that, you, that you've been struggling with, you know? Yeah, I think that's the, the, the age of 33. I think that's very much ingrained now. And then we can well, that. that or headstands in your conservatory, I think both of those, are, are, you know, both can be worked on, and that's what yeah. Shoppy's, that's what Shoppy's there to do. <laughs> it, yeah, I did mention to him that I'd uh, attempted that, and he said I was an idiot. Was, uh, for those of that are aware, I'm <laughs> six foot three and 105 kg. I'm not designed to be balancing in the headstand. So no, nor in a nor in a conservatory. A lot of glass. A lot of glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not not ideal. Anyway, we're uh, we have to talk about uh, coaching, not my inability to do gymnastics <laughs> um, so i suppose we're, we're progressing this on now so we've had two episodes where we've we've looked at the who and we're really going to try and connect that to to the what now so um harrison i think it'd be quite good now that you just give an outline of, of what what is um so what is basically you know your understanding of what you're going to coach um you know, I think you and I have had this discussion before and we've, you know, we, we tried to think of how we can simplify it. And, uh, and for me, the what in terms of what we're coaching is, the, is, is our coaching vision. Of, it's a vision of how we see the game. Um, and I, you know, I think that every, whether you're a coach, whether you're a player, whether you're just, you know, a man, woman down the pub that likes watching a bit of rugby, we've all got a vision or expectation of how we think the game should be played. Um, you know what we're going to try and explore in this next episode is is you know how can we channel channel all those visions from being quite um, colloquial you know a bit bit more informal and actually put it down into put it down on paper so we can take it to take it to our players we can take it to other coaches we can form discussions around around you know what we what, what our vision is of the sport to build the foundations of creating you know, that a performance model for for our players to succeed in yeah, and I, I think if you were if we were to put a questionnaire out to everyone that, that maybe listen, they'd all probably say that, that this isn't going to be this. This will be stuff they're already doing. They'll, they'll have ideas of of how they want to play, and they'll be structuring it in a way that they can feel as though that it's, it's the bring into life on a Saturday. But actually, the ability to write it down and simplify the complexity of what you want is actually quite a. a a difficult task in some cases and um you know we go through this process with the, the students on the undergrad degree and it's it is it's, it's it's having that process of really clearing one understanding your sport and then two being able to recreate that in the environment that you're working with for what what's right for for who in what circumstance and why because you've got to be prepared to tailor that model to suit them wants and needs of the participants well, exactly, and this and, and and creating this model, you know, can be applied in, in in every context that you go and work in within coaching. You know, we're just you know, it's it's the foundations of of how you can adapt your coaching sessions, your training sessions on field and potentially off field. You know, for for the different for the different players that you're working with. Um, you know, I think the, the beauty of having it written down, like I said, is is that it can form those topics of discussions with other coaches you might be dealing with. You know, I think a good example is, is, is yourself and myself when we were both working on you know, because we both had these performance, before we had these mental models with us, you know, we were able to you know, sit down and discuss, you know, how do we get to that point, right? So how can this, you know, how do we see this working with our players? And actually, you know, breaking it down and simplifying, you know, the sport, which can be deemed quite, com quite complex, you know, allows us to, to translate and, and talk to the players from very, very various levels. Um, you know, when when you're working, especially in the community game, when you've got players who have, you know, might be in their forties that have played, you know, 20, 20, 30 years of their life, and then you've got inexperienced players who are eighteen who might have just just taken up rugby. You know, as a coach, I've got to be able to get across how we want to play, but you know, because I'm because I've simplified it and I've visualised it in into text, you know, I'm able to have these discussions 
both with the experienced players and the in inexperienced players to create that to create that shared that shared understanding across the whole team. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, just as a youth, just as a task now, you know, I think that we can. When when we first when I first started the masters and we did the module of understand analyzing sports performance, they they got us to sit next to someone in the room, just like a, a an icebreaker type thing, and you had to try and um, explain your sport in two sentences. So just now, if you're listening, just try and try and summarize your sport in two sentences, because it's quite challenging. Because uh, and that and that's the start of the process to to realize actually how do you really just narrow down what is the goal of, of a, an invasion sport like rugby well, that's, um, it's, there's just just to jump on that uh, chris you know there's um i think there's a good there's a good clip on youtube of uh, david beckham going into um going working with jungle tribes and trying to explain football to football to them and you know that's that's how difficult these invasion sports can be um we might even link link that youtube clip down below just just to give you a bit of extra viewing if we can try and find it because that, that, that's exactly what I was going to talk about is you know I suppose you could brand it as the Beckham test is someone that you <laughs> would have as you class him as an expert within his sport because of the level that he's played he's captain England he, he has a level of knowledge of football that you would expect everyone else to have but when you come to someone in the Amazon jungle who has never seen a football before and in that clip he starts talking about comparing it to teamwork and how they work as a group to go and get the, the harvest and the, the speak to to, to Beckham afterwards and ask him how did you find that and he was, that was really really hard to actually simplify what football was when essentially it's just a bag of air being kicked around a field <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, probably not, I'm probably not doing it justice there there's a lot more to it than that but no it, 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 he found it really really difficult and you know if you really want to uh, all invasion sports to a degree have the same common goal and that is to invade someone else's territory to score more points than the other person. What dictates how you do how you, you do that is the rules. Or in yeah. our case from rugby, it's the laws. So this is when you start building that process of, of, of a mental model. It's can you can you define the goal of the sport in as short a process as possible? So for rugby, rules, that's, so sorry, for rugby that's just outscoring the opposition, is it not, Chris? Well, yeah, two teams of 15 trying to score more points than the other people in 80 minutes. Easy. You know, as easy as that. But the rules then dictate how you do it. So that's when the game gets complex around you can only pass the ball backwards, for example. You have to carry the ball in your hands. You can kick it, but most of the easiest ways to carry So this is where then the complexity of the sport comes in. And that, that's where as coaches we need to, to we need to work our way through that to work out what are the key performance problems of the sport. So you've got the goal, the goal of the sport, the rules, and then both of them together will shape the performance problems that you will encounter as a coach. Yes. And once you know, once you've identified these, you know, these performance problems, it's you know, then the next step in terms of creating this, you know, this this mental model or, or vision is um, you know. It's how we actually go about how we actually go about you know combating these performance problems. Um, you know this is uh, it's difficult and it's different for each different for each coach and there's probably no right or wrong answer in on this. Um, you know, you, for example, we can look in the in the lower leagues of Yorkshire. We've got some coaches that will just you know kick it, show up the jumpers, or we've got some players that or some coaches want to want to play it out and uh, and outwit. So this is where the performance models become a little bit more individualised. Uh, sorry, the mental model is kind of a little bit more individualised, and you know it starts to build those foundations going forward. Yeah, and and I think that's the the, the whole purpose of once you've got that mental model is around uh, simplifying the complexity for your players, so they have a better idea of what they are trying to do where. So that's exactly. how it relates to into rugby. So in in rugby, you then the key diff, the three key areas in terms of the performance problems would all would revolve around attack defense and then the contest so contest is what makes the game unique in terms of rugby union to rugby league because we have the contest at the breakdown the scrum and the line out as an example as well as then you know the kicking contest but then attack and defense is quite important because they both provide provide different contexts of what you could do where 
Yes, and and you know we can you can touch a bit on. You know, I know that some mental models would like to focus on that on on, on the transition in as well, and from from attack to defense or defense to attack. Um, you know, and I think from our perspective, and uh, we've had discussion over this. You know, with our mental models, which we're going to touch on a, a little bit a little bit later on, um, is that you know attacking is you know attacking from a, a contest is, is is the same as transition, and it depends. You know, it depends on a number of different factors. So. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll share our mental models. We'll, we'll link we'll link on our social medias with with those, so we, you guys can have a can have a look at them all as well as we go through them in a little bit more detail now. Yeah, and you know, use them as an example because once you've got them, you know, I'm not saying that ours are perfect by any means. There's, there's loads of ways that you, you know well, you might think yours is mine's very much in it. <laughs> I don't think mine's perfect. <laughs> but, I don't. I don't. Um, but no, I think it's, it's a starting point because I think once you've got this idea you can then shape so for example both of ours um relate to have the pitch involved because the pitch massively influences how you want to play the game but they're just the the, the main sub headings there are, are just guidance on what you kind of want to see there rather than actually what what could happen because that is then the difference between once you've had your mental model to a more performance-based model because the performance model is trying to articulate what you actually want to see happen on the on the in the game and that's uh, and with the performance model that's very much variant upon which the players you've got so if i walk into a club and i realize that oh i've got a nice big heavy pack my backs you know they're not as uh, they're not as dynamic in terms of their carrying so how does how can you know use my mental model to impact what we can do with this group of players well that goes back to the it's constructive alignment isn't it it's, it's aligning the who the what and the how together so once you've got an idea of yeah this is how i this is how i vision this is how i see the game to play you've got to see what what you've got available and then it's got to adapt to the wants and needs of the participants that you've got so for example if you're coaching under nines the the, the performance problems of the game are completely different because under nines the only rule that's introduced is the tackle and run forward pass backwards <laughs> <laughs> but there's less emphasis there in terms of, and you're not playing on a full size pitch so you've got the key performance stuff that you spoke about with Stuart around go forward support continuity pressure there's still the probably the main areas that you would focus on um, uh, in terms of how you then work your way maybe up the field to try and score but from a technical point of view the only thing you need to focus on is the tackle the, the rules are different therefore your model needs to adapt yes yeah, and, that, and that's, uh, that's I think that's quite an important point that um, our mental models, you know, form our, our vision of, uh, of the game of rugby union. Um, however, they do need to be applied and adapted depending upon which age group that we might be working with. And, you know, and that goes back to our first three podcasts of really understanding who we're working with. We can't start, you know, we can't move on to the final step of how we're going to do it until, first of all, we've understood what we're going to do and who we're going to do it with. Um, and they kind of go hand in hand, really, um, you know, because, because if, if they don't go hand in hand, you can't you can't create a, a good progressive environment for those players to thrive, I don't personally think, anyway. Yeah, no, no, I 100% agree. I think what, what's worth maybe actually, within yours, you very much talk about um, risk-reward and yeah. how that wider impacts on on the decisions and, and how we look to play the game a little bit there. Um, just just talk about how that features in your mental model and then because that, that will heavily link over to when we go on to aligning that to a performance model. Yeah, so um, when I created my mental model, I used a number of different um, different sources in terms of uh, understanding, understanding what I wanted to do. Um, so I did a lot of notation and analysis and I used a lot of statistics um, that I just gathered from the internet. And you know, similar to yours, I broke down the pitch into three main areas: um, the third of the pitch nearest nearest our own try line, the middle third, and then the final third. Um, you know, through that analysis, I then you know discovered that um, it, within those areas comes different risks and rewards to to, to our play. Um, you know, you and I have are on that um, are on that philosophy that we're not we're not here to discourage players from looking up, for example, in their own twenty two, looking up, seeing there's an overlap, and actually executing it. And, and, and progressing up the pitch that way. Um, however, it's important, and this is what my mental model touches on, that the players understand 
the risk and rewards to that. Um, you know, for example, if I've noticed that we've got an overlap and I'm going to throw that big long pass, the reward of that is, is a it, it might be a line break. And we made a line break and we made it to the halfway. Um, but the risk of that might be it, we've executed the poor, or we've executed a poor pass, they've intercepted it and we've conceded five points. Whereas if we're in oh, the opposition, you, pardon? You get the ball away and you, you knock it on as a scrum. Yeah, and all of a sudden we're, we're defending in our own red zone. Where actually, if I inside their 22, that that risky pass might be on a little bit more because if that if we if we if, if we score from that, we've gained a try, we've scored points, which ultimately we want to do. But if we do knock it on, we're still in their red zone, or if we do give away interception, we can still cover back and actually stop them from scoring, and actually penetrating into our into our own red zone. Um, you know, in terms of how we go on and implement this into in, into the players. It's actually just that understanding of where we are on the pitch, what are our actual outcomes there, and weighing up the pros and cons to different decisions. And that might be a lot for a player to do, but when you're in that, when you're in that moment, if you've got if you've got this in mind, I you know I personally believe that I'm able to think a little bit more clearly and, and have that understanding of oh, right, if I throw this pass, it might come off. However, there's a high risk now that I might mess up and put ourselves on the back foot or maybe even conceding points. Yeah, definitely. So um, like we said, we'll hopefully try and uh, add our mental models on so people can clip them on as a, as a bit of a, a download if, the, if they do want to see them. But essentially, like you said, we, we brought the pitch down into them, them three key areas, haven't we? So probably up to the 22, I think maybe a bit further, halfway, um, and then into the opposition's half. And that essentially in, in attack, you're looking at sort of game territory, progress the ball forward and score. Um, and then from a defensive defensive point of view, you're looking at how you defend that territory, pressurise the attack and prevent score. And then through each of them, different situations is when the you'd expect to see different out different outcomes, moments, decisions being made by players in each one of them. And, and that's when we'd start building it up to to be more look to more to, to look more like a performance model, more like the the common language that you might use and the strategy you might use. Just just to add on to that, you know, we don't have to disregard the other elements when we're when we're progressing up the pitch. You know, for example, when with my mental model and, and as, as Chris said, you'll be able to see it. Um, I've broken in in each zone in each third. We've got prevent, advance, and, and score. And on my mental model, they're, they're just different sizes in the text because even if we're in their 22, you know, we, we can still be cautious of preventing them from scoring. Um, you know, so, this, so this is where we really do focus, where risk and reward for me, it plays a major factor in understanding my mental model anyway um, for the players uh, as well because you know, we, can still prevent, we can still prevent opportunities for, for them to counterattack uh, and transition into their attack whilst we're still attacking in their third. Yeah, 100%. 100%. It's, it's all the, they've got to be aware of the different things, the different outcomes that I say are going to happen. That, like, so you can still throw that um, 30, 30 meter miss pass in the, the opposition 22, they get this intercepted and they run downfield and, and Scott, for an example. Or, you know, the, you, you defended a scrum there, they kick downfield, you don't have a good carry kick change, but your winger or fullback. They managed to run through, catch it, and score under the posts. Um, similar to our try against South Malton at Twickenham, actually. Um, that's a that's a story for another day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose then that one, once you've then, uh, and this is again goes back to uh, the who. One, once you've got your idea of your mental model and how you see the game to be played, you've got to go back to the players and include them for it to start to become a, a shared mental model, don't you? Yes, yes. And this is where, um, this is what I really touch on in, within my dissertation. Um, uh, my dissertation is basically a case study of, of what I did to implement a mental model in, in a community game whilst I was head coach at Old Otley Indians. Um, yeah, so understanding the players is it, it, it pivotal in that next step of, of, of creating a mental model. Um, you know the players at Old Indians as well as, as well as I did. And we've, there we had a very very wide range of age, didn't we? From eighteen up to 20, up to forty four, I think the I think the the oldest was. Um, so their visions and expectations of the game are also probably very different to mine as well. Um, but 
getting to know them on a, on that personal level of spending those you know the, the, that time at the bar just discussing rugby and just talking a bit of bit of bit of rubbish with them you know enables you to 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 share that to share that vision and actually brings brings your vision and their vision cl more closely aligned um, because they will have they will have you know ways that they think the game should be played based on their old previous coaches and previous experiences in the sport and as a head coach you've got to be able to bring those players together to all be able to sing off the same uh, sing off the same hymn sheet on the pitch on on a Saturday. Yeah, because everyone's got their own beliefs, concepts and values that will influence what they want to do. And essentially what we're trying to do with this mental model is get everybody on the same page. Because if you can get everyone on the same page, you can then start having more um, faster-based decision-making, I suppose, because everyone's got an idea of what the, the aim and the objective is within a, a certain area. Yes. Yeah, and that's, and that's probably... It, it, is a hard, it is a hard thing for coaches to do. Um, and you know when it pays off because there's everyone, every coach will have a game in mind in which you just sit back and go, they, they listened, they understood, and it came off. And you just come off with just the, 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 the best feeling in the world. And you just, you're just happy for the rest of that day. See, but for us, I think that was a tricking them off. <laughs> I think when it all clicked together, it was either that or the semi final, I think, for me. But what, that's where you just sat there and went, yeah, everything that we've done, everything we spoke about, it's all just come together. Um, yeah. Oh, totally, totally, and you know, and it was that's that's the players that are bought that are bought into in, into our ideology. But that's that 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 for me had come from myself, you, uh, and Quinny really taking our time time to to work with the players both on and off the field. I think a lot of coaches, especially at uh, the lower levels, tend to neglect what they can do off as much as uh, what they can do off the field which actually I think for me created more profound moments of learning than than actually being on the pitch yeah because we used to I mean even at level what we were level nine and level eight when, when we got promoted we we were still conducting preview of games and reviewing games but what we were previewing wasn't necessarily well it wasn't focused on what they did well or what they didn't do well. It was really focused on what did we do in this situation that relates to how we want to play and, you know, how we would get them to watch three clips of attack and then they'd have to reflect back relating on what we actually want to see here. You know, it's getting them to fully buy into that learning process that you, you don't just learn on the grass. You can yeah, do real powerful learning in, in the bar with a screen and a pad and paper. Yeah, and for uh, the reason why you know I, I felt that that was successful for us in, in that environment, and it might not be successful for uh, successful for everyone, but you know, we allowed we gave the players the power and of that discussion. So we basically became just almost we just guided them through 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 discussions, and those players because they were, because they were talking to each other and they engaged within you know share, creating that shared understanding between themselves. I think it that just created a, a much more profound profound impact on them. Yeah, hundred percent. So I suppose that brings us now on to, to to the next bit. Well, actually, how do you then build once you've got your mental model? How do you then turn that into performance model? Yes, which is which is the um, probably the, the slightly harder bit. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, well, I think I think for, 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 this is where. This is where you put your. Everyone could. There's only so many ways that you can, you know, phrase how rugby is going to be played. There's, but what changes is what actually happens on the pitch, and this is where you can actually hold some form of. You put your own little personal. Tweak to it, don't you? You make it specific to what you like and what you want to see, and your vision and philosophy of how you see the game game to play. So, mean mean you are quite aligned, and we like to see wide, expansive rugby. I, I, don't, I don't want to coach a, a, a team that constantly revolves around playing forwards off nine. I want to spread the ball. I want to play with width. That, that's how I vision the game to be played. So I can tailor my performance model to suit that. If you are have a different view and you see that things should be done differently, you can still tailor it to that situation. Yes. Yeah. And there's like, like I said previously, there's, 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 there's plenty of examples that each and every one of you guys listening or watching can think of coaches that 
that have just the complete polar opposite in terms of views on 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 how they on how they want to play the game. And we come across clubs, you know, even around when we were coaching in Yorkshire, we came across clubs and we just knew we were going to be a show up the jumper forward base club. But it's once again it goes back to what works for them in that environment. Now success is very different for lots of different coaches, as as we, as we previously said. Um, so for that for that club, it might not be performance based, but they just enjoy the they just enjoy playing that way. Now that's not for you or I to judge from an outsider's perspective. We've we've come in with our vision and we've implemented that with our players, and our players. I like to think, <laughs> I like to think they enjoyed they enjoyed the way that we played, um, because you know we had we had a, we you know we had a very successful first year there. Um, so you know, it's there's there's no like, 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 like I said there's no right or wrong way of of implementing it, but once again it, it's pivotal that you understand that that who and and what the players want to get out of it in order in order for you to to get success whatever that success looks like. Exactly, I, I think now we, we we probably move on to actually how how we did that. I think from a from a, a bit of a, a a learning perspective, and I think if we if we one way, so again, if you if you want to click on the links, download the, the what, what we've got, and that might help as we're as we're going through the discussion. But essentially, the, the the way I started that process is even when you looked at my my mentor model for, like I said, the, the players that we had at an amateur level, and I think this is important because they're not what you cut class as a scholar of the game, I suppose, because they just want to turn up and play rugby and enjoy the training and enjoy the games it was still probably still too complex. So I went through the process of, right, we need to simplify this even more. So I broke it down into colours. So we had blue, amber, green. So blue would be anywhere within our own 22. And as, yes, granted, a, a lot of play, a lot of people associate that as the red zone. Um, but during, you know, my master's, I was doing a bit of reading and found that actually colours, the, the, the colour association of red causes danger that can sometimes then cause players to make more erratic decisions because they feel under pressure because of the nature of the colour red. So by having a blue colour, it's meant to be a little bit more calmer and might help in terms of how players view what they're going to do in that area. So that was the view around the blue. The amber was sort of the middle part of a field. And then the green was was very much the opposition 22. We we come away with points or we, we force an error. Once, once again, though, we very much let let the players decide how they want to describe those zones. So we we created those colours to to split the pitch up, um, but then once again we left it to the players to to come up with key phrases that they can. So as soon as they think of blue blue zone, they could associate these key phrases with that with that area. Um, you know, and they came up with words like calm, um, exits. You know, they wanted they, you know, they were the words that they associated with the blue zone in it for them to for them to actually identify what they need to do in that zone and and and, and once again that risk and reward that, that that might that might occur and how we did that was was through a presentation so the the players all got given an example of, of, of a picture of the mental model with the colors idea on and they could go into to small little groups and talk about what they wanted to see in that area of the field so i think for, for the next barriers and if you don't want to do it this way just feel free to mention it uh, I, I think we should we just go up the field up through the blue amber green and just talk about the performance expectations for each one yes yeah, yeah. That first year more than happy to yeah fine so uh should we look at um the the, the attack or defense first which, which would prefer? we'll go we'll go with attack because you know it's a lot more interesting but, isn't it <laughs> so attack in in the blue so that was classed as gain territory you know we we everyone knows that you just want to the, the whole objective is eventually to kick the ball downfield i suppose but there's, there's a few different options that you can you've got basically three options inside your 22 you've got kick not the snot off it off field as far as you can you've got kick and compete so kick it high and hopefully a bit longer than you think with a good winger kick chase to try and regain possession in the midfield. Or you've got the higher risk strategy of run it out, see if you can run, play to an edge and see if you can exploit space. So as, as you alluded to earlier, they have three different risk reward areas. But the performance element that we put on there was, right, guys, we're not going to tell you which one of them to have. You could pick any one of them options, but you've got to have picked, you've got four phases when I would then expect you to kick. 
Yeah, and we within that within the sessions we created that as a, as, as a game. Um, you know, the, and the, and and the game that we used within those sessions was you know you've got four phases to get as far up the pitch as you can, and however how, the further you get, the more point the more points you get before the team swapped over and they did it again. And I think that that really helped reinforce those expectations in that in that blue zone. That they didn't they didn't have to take those four phases every time. We, that was that's pretty clear. If they get kicked from, if they if they catch it from a restart and they decide to catch it and then get the, not a snot of it, as, as you like to say, um, straight off the first phase and it's successful, then that's a positive outcome. You don't that, have to play the four phases, and I think it was important that that, that, that we mentioned that. Understand because that, that allowed them to explore the different decisions and and each one and, and and as a coaching tool, we were then giving them feedback on what the overall outcome was. Yeah. As well as some of the stuff that we might. have potentially seen or you know but we would never be overly critical of the outcome that they had no. that, that decision made because it's the, they've got a process all the different experiences that happen in front of them but what was good about that i think what's good about that session design was that the outcome is a, is almost a good enough learning moment for them anyway because if they if they catch it and they decide to kick it and it gets charged down the opposition score and they get minus points they know straight away that right that was a negative outcome and then that provokes that next next conversation where us as coaches can step in or other players can step in and actually offer them feedback to why that that didn't work on that occasion. Because yeah, that was in the gut negative. Because the when they kicked, the, if it didn't go out, the opposition that would transitioned into attack could play for three phases. I think it was as well, couldn't they? So they got negatively point scored depending on where they ended up. If they yeah. ended up back in their own twenty-two, you you lost more points because that was a a, a negative. Gain territory, you end up back to where you started. So it does. It just allows the players to to explore different solutions to problems, and that's what we want. We want players who can look at a situation and go, right, I know I need to gain territory here, but can I look at the defence and try and come up with the best outcome that's going to reward us to get go forward? Yeah. Um, from a defence point, from a defence point of view, in the blue. That obviously changes a little bit, and we just went through the, the 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 mentality of thirty feet on the floor. So keep that communication and connection. Keep thirty feet on the floor, and take the space away. Yes, yeah, and, and it's, it's important that when we're in that connection and that, and that communication is 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 in that and it's vital within your own twenty two. It's vital anywhere on the pitch in terms of defending, um, but more so in our, in the blue zone. Um, because you're you're in prevent mode. You're in prevent. I've got to stop them from scoring. There's nothing else that you're necessarily going to be thinking of. It's how can we stop this team from scoring and ultimately get the turnover. Um, so working with the players, and we created that that philosophy of 30, 30 feet, um, thirty feet on the ground, um, meant that you know we're working hard together as a team. So as soon as we hit the deck, we're back on our feet straight away because we don't want any men out of the game and off the floor. Um, and that allowed, once again, that allowed the players to really buy into that philosophy of, of working hard to get back on our feet to, to go and smash the next guy. Yeah, and it it did have a positive impact because in that, that season alone, I think we averaged conceding 11 points a game. So just through having that basic principle of keep 30 feet on the floor, keep that connection, get off the line and take the space away, false an error, you can get the ball back that way. Yes, and then all, all of a sudden we're, we're, we're transitioning into our attack, in which they then apply the same principles we just discussed in attack within the blue zone. Yeah, definitely. Because if you force an error and get a scrum, then you know, you've know you got an opportunity then to, to play. Yeah. Yeah. In terms if you, of the-, if you, well, the thing is, if, if you take a left-hand side scrum, as an example, in, inside your own 22 where you're attacking... That's a seven v four overlap if you're in attack because you've got to hold the winger on the blind side. The fullback and the other winger are, are, are covering for the kick, so there's going to be space to play. So you know it's a good opportunity to play if you can force an error, get a scrum, and, and play from there. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. In terms of going forward into the into the next phase, we'll be um, looking at the amber. Do you want to start with the attack or defence within the amber? We'll, we'll stick. With, we'll go with attack. We'll go to attack. We'll always start with attack. I say it's more exciting. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it is better when you're attacking. Defending is just all about getting back on your feet and hitting the next person in front of you. If you defend for 80 minutes, you're very sore afterwards and very tired. Attack is so much more fun. 
Um, yeah, as 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 a bloke who likes coaching defence, I, I I do love the people people underestimate the intricacies of a, of, a, of a solid defensive line, and you know when I don't deny that. I just enjoy attacking more than I do defending. But then there are some players out there that just absolutely like getting off the defensive line and, and smashing the next the next guy in front of them. But yeah, we can't get into the debate of attack versus defence because they're both they're both events, they're both essential to the game of rugby. Just, um, just leave a comment below with which one you prefer. Let's see, <laughs> let's see what the community says. So in terms of um, the amber, the main focus there is, is once again is progressing the ball forward. Um, you, know, we, you want to move it into that into that in, into the green zone that that final third um, because that's where you. Ultimately, we're going to score the tries. We're going to score the majority of your, of your points. Um, so, for us, uh, you know, as, as coaches, we want to progress the ball forward. Now, we can progress the ball forward in, in a number of different ways. Um, once again, we can we we can run it. We can play. We can play and run it. We can we can pass our way um, to progress forward. And then ultimately, and probably, I think the one that isn't looked at much within this middle third is 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 that kicking is that kicking option. And you know we are seeing a bit of a, re, a resurgence of that within the international game of of looking to kick for territory and and if we're not if we're not getting anywhere within that middle zone we can we can play a kick over the top um, you know so that that is another option that we did explore with our players. Yeah, and we brought the pitch down into three key areas, didn't we? So we had the wide, the middle, and the edge, the wide, middle, wide. And the 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 idea was once you've been in one part of that zone to try and get to the next one, wasn't it? Yeah, so in terms of in terms of our width, yeah. So within within the width, we yeah you know, we had our two focus points on the outside and a focus point in the middle. And we ideally, in an ideal world, we wanted to get from each one of the focus points within within each phase. Now, that's we do, we know that rugby isn't played in in the ideal world because um, if it was, we wouldn't be needed as coaches. Um, so you know, we knew that there was going to be different different constraints in place, um, and that's where the you know, the players really were empowered once again, you know, to, to play what they they kind of see fit. So if they played, you know, for example, uh, you know, we might have eight, nine, ten phases not going anywhere along the, along the halfway. Now, how can we progress the ball forward? Well, at the moment, running and passing isn't necessarily an option because they've decided to defend with 14 men at the top with, with only a fullback in the backfield. So that's where you know allowing the players to assess the different options and creating different different constraint-based games within our practice, we're able the players are able to spot to spot those opportunities in behind. Yeah, I mean that we'll, we'll touch on this later on in the series around sort of how. But that was very much how we our training sessions were structured around one of these zones, whether it was attack or defense. And um, trying to give players the um, the experiences of moments that might or will happen within an actual context of a game. So if we can recreate that as much as possible, again, that's going to help make faster, more intuitive players. Faster decision making, not faster. <laughs> Some players just can't get faster. No. Me and you, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not my, not my father. So, so go on. So, from a, from a defensive point of view, Harrison, as you do, like say, enjoy coaching defense. What talk about the pressurizing attack then in in that amber zone? Um. So for me, within that within that amber zone, um, one, it's the same kind of principles that we we, we discuss. Similar kind of principles we discussed within the blue zone, but we're just playing it further at the pitch, and we might not necessarily have that 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 fifteen in the in the front line. We We've probably got two or three drop drop back um, cover in the backfield, um, so this is where it's really important that we do mention you know, we do have that connection and that communication, um, and I think we along we along with the players that is um, decided we come up with 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 one rule in terms of our defence within that zone, and that was to successfully win the ball back within five phases, and that was kind of the benchmark that that, that we set ourselves as a as a as a playing group. That if we hadn't won the ball back within five phases, it's yeah, it, it's not deemed as successful as, as as it could have been. Now, winning the ball back within five phases might be a knock on or an interception or a penalty, but it also might be forcing them into that kicking option into into our one of our I think our strongest threats that year, our back our back three. Um, you know, so there's lots of different ways that, that you can win a ball back, and that's what we tried to get across to the players. But that really comes from we 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 called it the we called it the three C's, didn't we? And it was communication, connection, and a bit of bit of character. Um, you know that, that you need that grit and determination to actually want the ball back. Um, and that's what we really installed. Yeah, I think just to, to clarify on what connection is, because 
um, you know, this uh, th this idea very much came for me from um, just after the, the Rugby World Cup 2015, um, when I was um, uh, coaching West Park in Yorkshire One. And um, Sue Lancaster actually came down and did a, a defensive session with us. And we, 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 we did need some help that year. Our defence wasn't um, in particular good condition. And one of the things Stu emphasised there around connection was not having a triangle in your defensive lines, whether that's a, a standard triangle or an upside down triangle. So that's where everyone needs to go at the same line to keep that line together. Because the minute you've got any form of triangle, that's when a gap's going to appear. And that's when people can jump through the gaps and, and make, make yardage. So that's what we mean by connection is keeping everyone together and, and avoiding having them triangles. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I think one coach has referred to it as the daisy chain. Yes. Yeah. Bit, bit, bit hippie of him, but we're not one, we're not one to judge. Uh, no. no. So that, that, that then takes us into the and actually the, the uh, area that in attack is, is the most important area is 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 the green zone with the scoring points, whether that's five, seven or three. Yes, and I think the players that we're working with, once again, the terms that they come up with and the rules that they set themselves was they always wanted to come away with points, um, but they were willing to do that with patience and composure. Um, so when they get into that zone, they don't have to score straight away. And actually having that composure within that zone, and this is what I thought was you know, quite insightful from, from the players that we're working with, um, you know, that, that understanding of we're in here, our aim is to come away with points, if it takes five phases, great. If it takes fifty-five phases, we're still coming away with points. And I think that's 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 an important that's an important thing to remember. And whilst doing my, you know, whilst doing my analysis of of, of Yorkshire two um, and York, Yorkshire three, which I've said to you on many occasions, I think would be my specialist subject on Mastermind. The amount of games I have reviewed and and actually analysed, um, you know, I you know I found that you know teams. Were able, who were able to make a clean break into that into that blue zone from the amber, you know, over over sixty seven percent of the time, over two thirds of the time, they were able to come away. They were able to come away with points, and if that and if it got above five phases, that got the the, the chances of them score coming away with points was even was even was even greater because the defence are under under an increased amount of pressure to either give away a penalty or to give away the try. So it was. I was great. I was very happy when the players decided to come up with the words patience and composure within within the green zone because I think it gets we, neglected. We well, yeah, but we also stressed to them that that's when we we didn't expect them to go wide, middle, wide every time. That's when you are going to have to be more maybe pick and go, and and it's just like I say, the more phases you build, the more pressure that puts on the defense, and that 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 def that pressure is then going to result in the matter someone over committing, getting too excited and all the committing to a breakdown, which then creates space out wide and allows us to play. Or like you say, get, get to, again, a rush of blood to the head and ends up giving away a penalty. Yes, and and that's what, that's the pressure that being in your, being in the opposition or being in your own third can can create from either an attacking or defensive, d defensive perspective. Um, it's the teams who necessarily win the most rugby games are the teams that can actually score the most points per visit into the 22. The teams that are very much very clinical. And when we talk about clinical, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be within five phases. I know the amount of rugby matches I've watched where a player has made a break into the 22 and all of a sudden they've got a rush of blood that hasn't gone to their head. It's gone somewhere else in the body because they're that excited and they've actually cost and lost the team that opportunity. We don't, don't, for me, it's not being afraid of playing an extra phase in order to, 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 get, to get that intended outcome. And that's what we really try to get across to, to our lads. Yeah, and I, I, I very much, I'd recommend anyone um, to, there's a, uh, an online webinar, I'm sure it's still there, that Western Australia did with, with Gary Gold, and that was more on how to use, um, how to use performance analysis. And he, he talks about, um, the stats and examples that they used within the, the gold zone, they call it, um, about how they come away with points and how they judge their success on that. Um, and he also talks about what the actual percentage is in, in world rugby of the amount of people that go there and come out with points and how that contributes to winning games. So, yeah, it's it's, it's highlighting to players how, how important it is that when you do get there that you don't waste the opportunity. 
they do come away with points and that you take the, the, the chances that are available when they do come available. Yes, um, but they might not come they might not become available again. Yes. So if if I think all of us coaches can agree we'd like to see great rugby, but if you give me a three 0 win, I'm gonna be happy. We you know, all levels of the game, whether you're elite or or just community, winning feels just much better. And they're not, you know, when, you know, I'm not saying that that becomes the be all and end all of of a success at a club, but you know, we can all agree that when we were in the clubhouse after a win, the atmosphere is just totally different to when when it is if, if you've lost a game. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I've I've played in a three nil defeat away at Bridling, Bridlington for Oakley, and probably one of the wettest, coldest days I have ever spent on a rugby field. Uh, and that that's that's it's not it's not the best when you come away three nil down. It's, it's like well, how how have we not come away with anything? <laughs> now that's a game you want to watch the highlights on. <laughs> I'll see if I can dig them out for you. I'm sure there'll be something there. <laughs> um, so that then brings us on to defending then. So uh, this is we we sort of talked about manic line speed here, didn't we? Really trying to force an error from the from the then attacking team. Yes, uh, once again, I'll go back to my mental model, um, which I work so tightly on. Um, the risk, uh, the reward of winning a turnover in the final in the final third is just immense. You know, you've got the ball in a highly pressure zone for their defence, in which you can really implement your own attacking structure. And if it's off of turnover, it's broken play, and you're more likely to score quite quickly. Um, so once again, you know, we with that philosophy of we wanted more men on, on, on feet. Um, we encouraged the players to give that half a yard past the back foot. But as soon as we as soon as they passed the ball from, from from that ruck, it was it was manic line speed and we wanted to force as much pressure on that attacking team out of their own out of their own third as we possibly can. And yeah, I think manic manic line speed really does summarise what we wanted to get out of them. Yeah, because even if they get a, a kick that doesn't you know, don't go very far. Or uh, one that doesn't go out to then that allowed our back three to play. It's like you, you alluded to earlier, our back three were, were very strong that year. Um that, that then puts you in a in a stronger position as an attacking team. Totally. And you know, with you know, with an unsuccessful kick or a kick that isn't quite hundred percent where the kicker wants it is is prime opportunity to to, to hit back on the, on the, on that transition, on that counter attack. Um, and cause a bit of chaos in order to to, to progress nicely up the pitch and, and ultimately score. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I think so. That that is how we sort of started to build that performance model. So each area, just as a recap, so in the in the in the blue when it was gain territory and attack, it was four phases. You've got to have kicked, but you you they were fully aware of the three options that were available. In defence, it was very much around thirty feet on the floor take that space away from the opposition and, and force an error and most probably prevent them from scoring. Um, an advanced ball forward in the amber, very much wide middle edge, uses the space, move the ball, try and try and play some wide expansive rugby, um, try and force a line break to get into the green. Um, when in, um, in, in, in defence, it was very much focused around win the ball back in five phases, whether that's a turnover, possession or they've kicked the ball through to us um score points in the green score points keep the ball pressure uh make keep composure um and apply pressure and patience um defend territory manic line speed still keeping that key view of communication and connection try and force an error and, and stay where we are in that that that, that game territory and within that it, all of that is then underpinned with the, the with a common language and that's something that you've obviously you, you might already have in place as a club um we use Jack Queen King as an example for playing off nine, ten, or or, 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 or um, what was the other one? It's been 12. twelve. Yeah, twelve. Sorry. <laughs> um, I know there's all sorts of stuff of how other people tend to play. People roll one, two, three patterns offside first. Two. There's an array of other language that you will then use to support how you want to play. Yes. Yeah. And. Um... Just, just touching on that, on, on that summary, um, there's a load of different techniques that we use, like I said, both on and off the pitch, which you know, hopefully in, in later episodes we can, we can delve a little bit deeper, um, delve a little bit deeper so we can, we can actually 
begin to share some of the some 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 methods that we found successful and, and some methods we found less so because um, I think it's it, it's vital for us coaches to understand why certain things didn't necessarily work and and actually understand why they did work as well. Yeah, I think I think our, our, how we review uh, that's probably another episode that we could look at for for, for season two is is quite important because everyone's recording games now. But the amount of people that just watch the game back, we're actually looking for them moments, both positive and negative, that can reinforce the views of what you want to play. When everyone always talks about, uh, when I've seen them in the past, they revolved around the outcome. Of, oh, we knocked the ball on here. Or why have we missed this tackle here? What have you done here that's contributed to us end up having to score? Why are you such a lazy runner, as an example, that I got told quite a lot during my playing days? Um the Rook Inspector, I think the Rook Inspector is, is your nickname. Yes, it was. I think as going forward, I think we can call you Inspector Cluso. <laughs> but the review, I think, is important about how you can reflect back on what you've got in your mental model because that's going to provide the players with a more high quality feedback on what they can take into the next game. Yeah, and you're building on that. Having trust in your process is probably a better way to to review rather than focusing on the outcome because if you've got if you get your process right and you have faith in your process why why aren't you going why would you not be getting results yeah, i'm a firm believer that i i should be you know everyone could watch games now especially from from a lot of teams are putting them on youtube i know when we went up to to yorkshire too we found loads of footage online of how teams played and even though those, some of them were two, three years old, they were still playing exactly the same. So you can find content and stuff, but I should be able to give anyone all the information that we've given them now about how I see the game for them, because I will back my players to be able to execute it. So even if you know what to expect, I'd still back my players because of the process that we've gone to do it, to be able to execute that and at least contribute to them winning the game. You know, you control the controllables. You know, I can control how my team play. I can't control how your team play, but I can try and disrupt it. Oh, yeah, and that's all we can do as coaches. We can never, we you know, we can never control the opposition team because that's just more work than than what you're already dealing with. And you've got you've got 15 blokes that you're all trying to all women that you you're trying to get on the same same hymn sheet. Let alone another 15 on the opposite team. <laughs> It's 20, really, if you look at bench and stuff as well. It's, it's a lot of bodies to, to manage and think about. Uh, I think we've, we've covered pretty much everything there, Harrison. Uh, is, is there anything else you think we should add? No, I think we've gone into a, a, lot, a lot of detail on that in that last episode. Um, you know, I think if you don't want to go too overboard, it might, you know, there's a lot there's a lot we can talk about. Um, if, but if anyone does have any questions or wants us to, you know, talk a, talk about a bit more detail about what we have discussed in this in this last hour, um, you know, you can message us on, on on all of our social media platforms, and, and even comment below on on the YouTube. I think both of us would be more than happy to to you know, to go a little bit deeper with that with, with that conversation. And if you have any questions, yeah, like I said, just just drop us a message. Um, in terms of going forward, I think you know you've got an exciting little giveaway that you want to you want to share with us, isn't, haven't you, Chris? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope it'd be exciting. Um, so sort of Harris and I were talking about stuff that we could give away, and we we've got some news about our first little uh, competition. Um, so what we're uh, what we're offering is if you um, like the video on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, and then comment below on this episode's video. Um, we'll we'll put all the names into a hat. We'll, we'll do a draw, and that person will win an opportunity to come onto a, a Zoom chat with my, myself and Harrison, and we'll. We'll look at starting to develop a, a mental model and then a performance model for, for them that, that works for their their who. So does it meet what the wants and needs are for their participants in their age stage um, and go through how they could then start creating that model to then share with their participants um, to help help them a little bit and start putting some of this into their practice. Great. That sounds sounds like a prize that I want. Well, yeah, I mean you've you've already done it, you, really, so you don't really need the help. But it, I, I think it would just, I think starting to help people build this process is a, is a really good opportunity to engage people with a, a, a different way of doing things. Um, and, and I think from a rugby perspective, this is definitely a, a new way of trying to, to think about stuff and, and implement stuff. Yes, and it, it, I think, you know, we, we both discussed this and it definitely helped both of us in terms of our coaching practice to, to break down our mental model and, and actually create one. I think that's one of the most useful things we learned on the Masters. So, 
yeah, we're you know we'd be more than happy to help the the competition winner. Yeah, so like I say, all you need to do to enter is like this video, subscribe to the channel, and comment below on this video, um, and then uh, we'll we'll draw that um, on on one of the episodes uh, coming up in the future, um, and get in touch with the winner that way. So uh, thanks again for listening. Um, hope you have enjoyed it and um, got a lot out of it. Like we said before, if you've got any questions, drop us a line on any of our social media at Big Breakdown HQ, um, and we'll see you next time. Cheers for listening. Don't forget to join in the discussion at Big Breakdown HQ on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.